Where did Yark go? Home forever, hopefully. I'm going to miss his glazed over stare and his weird, <laughs> drooling, quivering bottom lip. I, I'm I'm not going to miss him just staring and doing nothing. Just just the stare like the, the darkness of the void. <laughs> just overtaking him forever. Oh. Uh, well let's hope let's hope he never comes back, because he was creepy. <laughs> well maybe maybe next week. Maybe next week. We'll see. So hello grumpy jump grumpy dungeon master Jay. Hello, Grumpy Dungeon Master Christopher. What are you doing today? Actually, I was sitting here reading a uh, PC Gamer article about a guy who played through Skyrim and, and only used illusion magic. Yeah, it's possible. Slow, no, but possible. No, no armor, no weapons, no punching, no other spells except illusion magic. And mind you, you I don't. Do I, I don't know, man. Uh, like, how do you even kill anyone? I'm, I'm only on the fourth page of this. I don't know how many pages or how long this thing goes on. Um, I'm pretty sure, unlike D and D illusion spells, which are only like create harmless effects, I'm pretty sure you can uh, create illusionary things that will attack and stuff. Maybe. Um, I, it's been so long since I've played Skyrim. I truthfully, I don't remember. Yeah, I'm looking for the spell list. Yeah, it, it, in the beginning, when he first started this thing out, like I said, I'm at the beginning of this article, kind of. Yeah. Uh, there was two methods he was using to sort of kill things. One was he would you know, train them to the guards or towards other people and get them yeah. to kill them for him, which is smart, and that's kind of what you do in the game anyway. And the other thing was if he had two people, he could cast Fury on one of them and let them yeah. fight. Because Fury, it just it basically pisses them off and they attack the nearest thing. Yeah, and that only works for a certain level and becomes Frenzy. Um, and then I think there's Hysteria. No, Mayhem is where up to level 25. So he had to keep his level low to keep the monster level low. Mm-hmm. And then, like, just probably use mayhem and probably invisibility, and kind of just like sneak around and do stuff, which I, I think is possible. I'm sh- I mean, I don't know how possible it is killing the dragon at the end. Pr- probably not. Oh yeah, for spoilers, ha- hashtag spoilers for fuckers who haven't played Skyrim yet, even though it's been out for a decade. Uh, but yeah, 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 yeah it, it's. You, you got to fight that dragon at the end. I, unless you can do damage, I don't see that ha- working. Unless maybe you know, maybe he trains it on some guard somewhere who can kill this thing. Oh, only ten. It came out November eleventh, twenty eleven. Yeah, like I said, it was about a decade. Hey, without looking it up, what uh, Legend of Zelda game came out twenty years ago? Oh, I've I've heard this one actually. It's like Twilight Princess or some shit. Wind Waker. Wind Waker. I don't know. Look, man, the last Zelda game I played was on the fucking Super Nintendo, and that oh, was that one. was that was thirty five years ago, forty years ago, thirty <laughs> yeah, probably thirty. It was thirty plus years ago. Yeah, well, it was definitely a long time ago. Yep, God, we're fucking old. Yeah. So, uh, I had to ask you right off the cuff, uh, uh, when you're DMing and you. DM games. We all make mistakes. We just kind of have to roll with the punches. I know. Um, I uh, I TPK my group kind of twice last night. Yeah. Uh, well, one one of them what really wasn't like my fault. They just kind of like victim of circumstance. Like they had basically pissed off the NPC that they were doing stuff for, and she's like, "Here, here's the fucking portal. Go through it. Do your shit and come back." And they're like, well, can we wait till tomorrow when we rest it up? She's like, no, I'm just doing this or this now. Your choice. And kind of gave them an ultimatum. And they were like, okay, we got to go through. And like the party's already half dead and they're moving on to the next dungeon without any yeah. kind of rest. So now they're in the shadow fell. And you, for, from, a, from a lore perspective, if you spend more than a day in the shadow fell, you're pretty much effed. Like, yeah. you will 
start just losing a piece of what you are, your life will just dissipate. Earlier editions had a spell to counteract shit like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't recall what it, the exact name off the top of my head, but it basically made you immune to basic effects of a plane. Right. Um, in this case, they um, they basically got so beat up after the first two encounters that they had to take a long rest. So they had to take a long rest uh, in in the Shadowfell. And they've been there for close to 24 hours. Close enough that I made them do the wisdom save for effects in the Shadowfell. And two of them have negative effects that carry over from the shadow fell. If you look up the, 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 in the DMG, there's actually the list. The list is only like three things long, mm-hmm. which is kind of, you know, for, for being in the shadow fell, which is p- pretty much a place for those who don't know, is just, it, it's the domain of the dead. And there's just, it's very draining. It's very like, just no color, everything just pulling out of you. You have an overall sense of dread. Everybody's crazy there. Like if you were to go down an alleyway in a town and then try to go back there, that town could not be there anymore. It's a very, almost ethereal place of being. And it's really cool. Um, and they're like in a Shadowfell version of the library that they originally did this stuff so they can get the the blade that they have to reforge. Yeah, hang, hanging out in the Shadowfell, it's like living inside of an Edward Gorey painting. Yeah. Drawing. So I actually found a list of, like, the guy expanded to three that are in the DMG to, like, 12 and added things like Impatience in there because, like, you know, you start going crazy after a while. After 48 hours, you're pretty much insane, you know? Mm-hmm. Some emotion that the only thing left of your humanity that you, you've latched onto is the only thing that, that, that drives you now. And even if you leave the shadow fell, that's going to always be there as like a lingering effect that you have to like fight against. So my players got subjected to that. Um, and, you know, they're going to be able to get to the sword and they're going to be able to get out. So what happened in the final fight is it was a very high level mage and a big fighter versus the party after the long rest. And they had used a couple spell slots. They decided for the third encounter, once they did their um, their long rest, they just decided the next encounter deserved fireballs, all the fireballs, and just fireballed the shit out of it. <laughs> yeah. They weren't they weren't even going to, to, to fight a monster. They're just like, you know what? We're just nuking this room from the previous room, and then we're going on to the end. And then the fight was, pre- uh, I thought it was a pretty good fight. Um, and they got hit by the the mage's own fireball and then they were able to counter spell cone of cold which would have really messed them up yep um uh the mage counter spelled haste i forgot to shield react and stop magic missiles from hitting me which caused the mage to pretty much get one shot at least in a round he had like he went from like 70 hit points to 10 <laughs> yeah that's um, what happens fucking <laughs> like a, one one wizard versus a party is just not not likely to work out well yeah but they had a but the big brute that was there just like large kobold um pretty much was greater in visibility and it was because i didn't shield the magic missiles is because the con save dropped and my question to you was, did you ever forget to do things? Because I greater invis the mage later on in the fight. Mm-hmm. And they were actually able to kind of like figure out where it was and attack it square. And two of the hits happened. And I forgot the roll of con save on the invisibility and just ran away. And uh, then it nuked the party again. There was one person left. And I kind of like, my daughter woke up and I had to kind of deal with that at the same time. But I rolled the con saves and I failed. So the invisibility would have dropped. And I did you know, stream shenanigans to kind of let the last hit kind of go through. But I pretty much I did that because I forgot to do the con save when I should have done the con save. So as a DM, what is like a common rule that you should always be doing? Do you always forget to do? Because I always forget the con saves. Oh, man. Um. I yeah, I will forget con saves. I will forget to do abilities. I will forget to cast certain spells as reactions. Like this is all just sort of things that you do as a dungeon master. 
Uh, I, I even own a fucking t-shirt that says, uh, I roll dice and forget things. Because that's literally what I do. I roll dice and I forget things constantly. You know, it it's one of those, it's just a thing that's going to happen. Suck it up, deal with it, try your best to remember going forward. Uh, now, as, do you do when you do forget things or remember that you forgot things that are critical to like, hey, if I would have remembered this, they wouldn't have TPK'd. Do you kind of like fudge your way out of that scenario like I did? I have never, honestly, I can't think of a single time where I've killed a party of players because of something I forgot. Okay, well, I've done done that a couple of times. It's, I, it almost always, when I forget, it works the other way around towards like harming my side and not theirs. Okay. Yeah, it, it, I don't know why, but that just seems to be the case most of the time. If I forget something, it typically... Uh, there have been times where I'll forget to... Uh, do some damage, and if we have, if we're still sort of in that same round of combat, I might throw in the extra damage if I don't feel like it's going to fully change the the way the flow of combat. Like if I was going to add extra damage and it's going to drop a character, then I probably am not going to do it. But if it's just going to add to the damage they've taken, I might, as long as we haven't moved too far forward into the battle. Okay. Like, I'm not going to backtrack a whole turn and say, oh, you were supposed to have taken this extra damage last turn. No, no, I just fucking forgot it. And lucky on them. Yeah, I don't I do not do that. Like, if I forget to do damage, I just kind of, like, whiff it 100%. But, in like, in this, in this particular scenario, it was pretty much, hey, shit, he shouldn't be visible right now. That 18 that he just rolled should have hit because he shouldn't have been invisible. And... <laughs> He would have killed him because he had two hit points. So, yeah, you know, I shenanigan to free critical because you can do that on my stream. If you have enough channel points, you can turn any attack into a critical. Mm -hmm. Technically, any attack, even mine as the DM, but please don't. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of did that with my my secondary account just to kind of like end that fight because they didn't deserve the TPK there. Um, yeah. Now, the, the TPK because I was like, OK, what's a spell that's as good as fireball but necrotic and there's a seventh level spell that's pretty much the same damage as uh fireball but it's just a massive necrotic spell and i use that and the fireball would have hit everybody and this spell definitely just hit everybody um and but they were already on their last legs and they just got people back up with all their healing spells and it was just like yeah bam nuke <laughs> there it goes and yeah. uh it, it happens um so like, so so are all, all of them dead no they're not dead actually they miraculously all saved um they're so the, the, earlier in the night they they were fighting but they were like said they were on their last legs because they didn't have a rest before they came into this dungeon and they just got beaten up by a bunch of the kobold warriors and the kobold shamans mm -hmm. and again these are leveled up for those out there who don't know, in the Al campaign, I have what I'm calling the Bandersnatch Kobolds. And um, the Bandersnatch Kobolds are pretty much very kind of corrupted a little bit. And they they harken back more to the first edition Kobolds, but they were a little, or they're kind of like scruffy looking and more dog like than Dragonoids. And it makes sense for the context of the Dragon Master that they serve in this case. And, um, so they're all like CR2, and the big broody ones are like CR3. Oh, they lift and weights, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they lift weights, bro. Uh, they're not small. They're all medium size. Um, so, and, you know, so fighting for them is a pretty pretty big fight. You know, that's a four CR2 monsters. That's, that's, that's quite of a big thing, you know? Yep. And we were down a player. We were down the healer, specifically. Um, and uh, the first time they basically pretty much just all got knocked out, except for the the blade singer mage, who is by the way that's that class is just broke I think in fifth edition. You think the monk's annoying? Yeah, this guy with like almost nearly infinite shields, oh, an AC God, of yeah. like twenty seven thousand. Oh, and can stab you. Yeah, not no, hard, I, but but enough. 
I remember we were talking about that previously before me. I think it was us and Eric who were talking about the Blade Singer being impossible to hit. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, he can just throw fireballs when he wants to. So Blade Singer is really good. If you if you want to play like a warlock, but you still want to be stabby, you know, or if you want to play a warlock stab, but you don't play a warlock, play a Blade Singer. It's it's real good. Um, so the Blade Singer is able to kill the the uh, shadow, um, and then everybody. There's no heals. Every single person saved and stabilized with their death saves. Mm-hmm. Like none of them f- failed all three. Um, and then at the end of the fight, there was enough healing left in the ranger to pick up one guy, one guy stabilized. And then the, the other guy got stabilized by a, a 27 something medicine check for some junk. So they all lived. Um, I will say though, monk, the monk, character that we got in the group for some reason he only has like 45 hit points at level <laughs> seven that sounds like, exactly like jacob like i'm not sure why it's that low if that's maybe that's the the maybe monks are supposed to be that low well no mon- monks get a d8 plus con bonus sometimes you just roll like crap uh well, like- I, i'm having them take the average so well yeah but even then if you're just taking the average which jacob that's what jacob's been doing because he's continuously rolled lower than the average, so I either allow them to. They basically everybody in my play, all of my players, they roll the dice to see how many hit points get, and they get if they get less than half, they take the half. Right. Uh, that way, okay. nobody ends up with terrible hit points. But despite that, you know, even at the level he's at, I want to say he has like thirty-eight hit points or something at sixth, seventh level. Like maybe yeah, maybe yeah. he might have forty two or something, but he has he has fucking garbage for hit points. I think the mage has more hit points than he does at the same level, which is really weird. I mean, if but, the roll, yeah, if the rolls are there. Well, like I said, the, they've all taken the average, so it's not like there's. Uh, does he to... have Does he have a con bonus at all? I'm looking right now. Actually, come to think of it. Yeah, I mean, um, but yeah, it, it was. The mage kept going down. The, the sorry, the, the the monk kept going down because the shadow guys would basically it's a shadow demon essentially. Yeah. And it would get it would get behind them, and it had to have advantage, so I get to do the super uber damage, and like thirty three damage psychic. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Two of those, you're down. Um. So yeah, he has. The main the monk has plus one constitution bonus. Um what's store life, full hit points. Come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah so he has forty five hit points. At what um, at what level? Seven. Yeah, he's still seven. Yeah. And then a little low. And then the and then the mage has sixty two. He has a plus three con bonus though. How much, um, how much con bonus did the monk have? You said plus one. Yeah. Okay. So there's that's a big discrepancy right there. Uh, yeah. Plus three con bonus versus a plus one at level seven. That's an extra fourteen hit points the mage is going to have over him. Yeah. I don't really think about. It. I mean, just one point goes a long way after a bunch of levels. Oh yeah, absolutely. Wow. But yeah, so yeah, yeah, they're kicking off. They're they're going to be given the quest to uh relive the last memory of um the town founder where yeah. she created the blade. Um so the the DM resources group that we're part of. I I saw somebody post in it today or yesterday. And because you're talking about TPK and your group and all. And what they were basically saying is if you TPK your party do you continue the story or do you just go do something else? So if you wiped your whole party yesterday, would you have continued the owl owl campaign or would you have decided, nope, that's the end of it, and then went and run some module? I don't know. Because this is a play test of of what I'm going to be publishing, 
I would I would have continued the story. I would have just waved off the TPK, kept the same characters, and just kept on going. Mm-hmm. Okay, and you know, because it's also a playtest too, I know that there's a possibility of a TPK happening. You know, yes. maybe I designed an encounter wrong. Maybe I designed it too hard or too easy, and you know, maybe I have too many cobalts in this room or too few. Um, so far, I think. A, a, all I, what I've learned in, in writing this whole thing and planning out the, the encounters and everything, I definitely overstat the encounters. I think I they have fewer encounters, but they're harder. So I think I have to kind of get more encounters, but make them all easier. That may be a better route to go. And that's what I'm going to test with this next dungeon. Is I'm going to have a lot of smaller rooms with just like three or four different monsters. And you know, nickel and diamond more than just like eat yeah, up w- a hit diaper fight. Yeah, if you're having a lot of encounters that are nickel and diming them, then you're go- like, I don't know how well that's going to play on stream, and it's definitely going to be more work on you. Well, I mean, I kind of follow the same way that they write them in uh, the campaigns, like the official ones they always seem to kind of go for more for the side of having a couple of encounters that are really hard mm-hmm. or like, you know, above, above average. And that seems to be the, the fight, you know? Yeah. Yep. Um, and I, I, I feel I follow that style because like, you know, this next dungeon that they're going to go through has maybe four or five fights. Okay. Um, and they're all going to be pretty substantial fights. So I, I thought about taking those four or five fights and making them like ten fights that are more balanced. You know, yeah, I'm, lo- I'm on the low to medium side versus the medium to hard side, with maybe one deadly encounter at the end. Where like when I set it out this library with all the kobolds, I shot for hard for every single one. So like the average was basically four CR2 monsters, sorry five CR2 monsters. And that's a hard encounter for a group of level sevens, five level sevens. Um, of course, when they went down a player, I didn't adjust. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that's part of it, too. But um, I, I think that maybe having more, I'm, I'm, not, no, I'm not sure which is better. It may just be a preference of the table, too. Yeah, I, I don't know that either one is really better. Yeah. yeah. It, it it really will depend on every every dungeon. You know, it'll depend on the table. It'll depend on what you prefer to run. I know that I tend to run like I'm just thinking most most of the time if I run a, a thing at night, I'll have maybe three, four encounters in a dungeon tops. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've done some dungeons that are ridiculous, but in general, that's that's three or four encounters. And the first ones are relatively easy. There might be one that's moderately difficult, and then the final one should be very difficult. Yeah, I kind of always plan for three encounters, all about medium to hard difficulty. Mm-hmm. And that's just because CR is kind of subjective, too. You know, yeah. like a really good, well organized team that's well equipped can just roll through hard encounters all night long. <laughs> you know, um, I haven't really geared out this group. Um, I guess that, that, I think it's a problem I really need to address. Um, yeah, they should have some magic they, items by this point. They they have some. Um, we rolled we rolled them on the table. They just didn't turn out well. Um, I know where I'm going to place some. Plus, uh, plus at the end of the day, they're getting a Vorpal sword, so it's like, well, that's for that's great for one person. That's great for one person. <laughs> Enjoy. You have an entire party of four, so. Um, but you know. Uh, I just, it's something I gotta, I gotta work on more, I think, just to kind of hand out better, better loot to the party because I'm trying to think now what they all have, they all got a boot at the very start of the game. Then they got a magic dagger. They got a magic javelin. Uh, they got a ring of spell storing. Uh, they got the horn of blasting. Now I have a question on the, I have on the ring of spell storing real quick. 
So mm-hmm. what what does your party put in that? It already it has five slots, and I think it has three shields remaining. Okay. All right. I just wanted to verify that your party are the same kind of assholes as my players. How's that being an asshole? Because all I do is put fucking shield in it. Well, that's how I gave it to them. Oh, okay. Fair. My, my, <laughs> my players, they actually just stock the goddamn thing with shield. Because <laughs> shield, uh, you know, it, it's the best spell in the game that I actually allow. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to silvery barbs, which I do not. Um, one is one is one one of the new players that came in because he came in late. I gave him a magic item, so he has a barrier tattoo, which is cool. It works for his character. And I think I think the I think they all have one magic item, whether it be a magic weapon or some kind of protective thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, where that's where me and you differ greatly. Um, I, there, there's there's a magic there's magic scale mail somebody's not wearing, but it's just magic scale mail like acid resistance. Um, there were there was an opportunity to buy a bobble that emitted bright light. Um, mm-hmm. There was a crack version and a non crack version that was offered to them. Um, because, but the, the 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 shop was a hobgoblin, and there was the Feywild hobgoblin that they were going to have in the playtest. Mm-hmm. Um, he's very, very, very shifty, and was definitely swindling them for money. Um, and if they had taken that item and activated it in the Shadowfell, it still would have emitted bright light. Okay, and that then turns off all of the abilities of all the, the kobolds, essentially. Because they're all, you know, when when yep. not when in bright light, when they can't when have the shit. Yep, yep. Yeah, the shadow demon couldn't have done shit. The shadow hounds couldn't have done shit. <laughs> you know, so so, they, didn't, they didn't buy it, of course. They didn't buy it, uh, and plus the priest wasn't there. I think I don't think this priest has daylight, but the other priest they had had daylight spell that would have helped a lot too. Um, but maybe I, I don't know, maybe. Yeah, maybe I'm not I, giving them enough like setup for things. Maybe because they're not like researching where they're about to go. But like I said, this in this particular case, it was very much like just go here, shut up. Yeah, we we differ greatly when it comes to magic items, and you know I've already we've rehashed this enough times. I, I like to run super powered games, or at least higher yeah. powered games. But at the point my guys are at, and I think they're seventh level also. Every one of them has at least a rare magic item. And probably a couple uncommons. Yeah, I definitely don't. That doesn't happen in my games. Uh, and I'm pretty sure by the DMG, they should all have at least two uncommons or a rare by that level. They should, the DMG, starting between level 5 and 10, is one uncommon magic item and 500 gold. So you can buy another uncommon magic item. Yeah, so two uncommons. Yeah. And they're sitting about at like two or three rares and two or three um, uncommons. Well, I'm I'm talking each individual player should have that. Every yeah. single player should have at least two uncommons. Right, two uncommons, and was it three uncommons are rare? No, two uncommon. Well, it depends majors and because there's majors and minors. Yeah. So like I said, they, they have they have magic armor, they have magic uh they got a I think they have a cloak of protection somewhere and the ring of spell storing, the horn of blasting. And it's, it's not like they haven't used these magic items to, to full effect either. Oh you know? sure, yeah. Yeah. When they were when they were fighting those emerald golems that would F them up and there's like horn Yeah, burr. horn of blast horn of blasting <laughs> might be good there. Hey, that encounter's over. Hey, this next five encounters all horns of blasting. You want to go? All right, let's just make this fast. I'm walking, blow the horn. Yeah, you blow the horn. I get it. Yeah. How much damage? Forty-five. Okay, so they're taking ninety. Okay, they're dead. Okay, next encounter, a horn again. Wow, that's trippy. One hundred and seventy-five damage this time. Okay, got it. Um, damn. Did it explode? No. Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> I really hope when the horn explodes. 
Yeah, like I've that, had it. I've had it happen to me before. Not with a horn, the, but with other magic that'd, items. That'd be the best character death. Is everyone's running away, and the 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 last Alan stops and turns around and pulls up the horn. And is like, <gasps> and it explodes, but causing the huge explosion that kills everything. Right. And that sacrifice is like, you know, then like embossed on the wall with this owl blowing a horn and like this nuclear explosion in the far background. Yeah. You you succeeded, uh, but also failed. But succeeded. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've, so, I've I've blown up magic items before. I We had a uh, staff of healing. We had just gotten it, and I used all of the charges in the very first combat that we got into, and then yeah. I rolled. I rolled the fucking one. <laughs> oh, that's great! I was that's like, great. son of a bitch. Being that we didn't have a cleric, we really kind of needed that thing. And we needed it. We used it. And now we don't have it anymore. Yeah, that's just yep. what happens. All right, we're back to potions. Back to potions. Good luck. So, uh, I added a new thing to the stream. I added in uh, uh, Grumpy Dungeon Master Panda's idea of having the eight ball. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, they pay, and, pay for the eight ball. Pay for the eight ball. Oh, wow. 20. Um, so, somebody invoked it last night when uh, one of the characters missed an attack. And they invoked the eight ball, and I rolled it. And I said, your five has become one. <laughs> <laughs> See, you got an eight, you got an eight ball that's actually a d twenty, but could you know it'd be a kind of a cool idea to make a tabletop game that is played with the actual magic eight ball. <laughs> hang, yeah. hang on, uh, list of magic eight ball ball answers. There we go. I, I wanted to see what it actually says. Uh, let's see. So yeah, just imagine if you were running. A, a tabletop game, and every time somebody rolls, you know, it, it'll roll and or come up with it is certain, or you shake the magic eight ball. Sorry, not roll it, uh, but it is certain. It is decidedly so, without a doubt. Yes, definitely. You may rely on it, as I see it. Most likely, outlook good. Yes, and signs point to yes. Like those are all sort of positive answers mm -hmm. for for the outcome. Then you have the sort of neutral ones. Reply hazy, try again. That sounds like a re-roll to me. Ask again later, better not tell you now. Cannot predict now, concentrate and ask again. And then you have the obvious failures of don't count on it. My reply is no. My sources say no. Outlook, not so good and very doubtful. I didn't know that the, that the, that the die inside the Magic April was a d20. I actually never knew that either. I've seen, I, like, a friend of mine had a Magic 8 Ball when I was a kid. You could just shake it. But I only remembered, like, four or five answers. I did not remember, like, this one actually has 20 listed. Right. What, is it, what does it look like on the inside? Because that die is shaped very oddly. Well, the, the Magic 8 Ball is a fucking ball. It's not a die. <laughs> no, there's a, there's a die on the inside. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's just a triangle. I have no idea how that thing fucking works. Um, I'm not going to sit here and read off how this thing works right now. This is, I'm on no, Wikipedia. No. Somebody can look this shit up. So it is, it, it is actually a D20. It's just a very small D20, and it's magnified through the lens and it just has all like the, the 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 text raised so when it floats up to the top it pushes all the blue ink out of the way so the blue is not there uh -huh. and it has a letter show up so it's actually a very small d20 that's interesting that's kind of neat yeah. yeah well it's two inches well an inch no it's about an inch it's yeah the size of a d20 yeah yeah, I, th I think this would work for like a Cthulhu style game or something like that. Yeah, that works. Just because it gives you, you know, very vague answers some of the time. <laughs> will Will Cthulhu eat us? Uh, signs point to yes. Uh, seven. Okay. Uh, so I actually got a topic for us to talk about a little bit. Oh now yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that we've delayed. And nope. proving me well, wrong multiple times. Well, so much of what you, we've already talked about kind of ties into this whole thing anyway, so go yeah. for it. 
So I w- I've been asked multiple times this week from multiple different players, um, it's most from Adventures League or from outside of Adventures League, um, basically asking is like, hey, how do I start being a dungeon master? And it took me a while to respond to the first one because I don't really know how to start dungeon master other than just like, hey, buy the starter set, jump right into doing it, have some friends, don't fear making mistakes. You know, that's my basic guidance right there, you know? So let's um, start Let's start at the beginning kind of of our own journeys. I think okay. that's a good way to sort of help people understand how to become a dungeon master. So with yourself, how did you begin with role-playing games, D&D, and then how did you become a dungeon master? Because your path was probably different from mine. More than likely. So for me, it was simply, I was listening to Chris Perkins play 4th Edition with Acquisition Incorporated. Um, I liked what was going on. I wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons. I bought the red box for fourth edition, which had a very standard adventure and a set of DM dice. And I convinced a bunch of people to come out and play fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons with me. It was like two or three players, maybe two to start with. Mm -hmm. And I just started from there and ran the, the box adventure from the starter kit. So were these people you knew? or They people? were friends of mine, yeah. Okay. And they were all like, 4th edition sucks. Okay, cool, yeah. but it's what I bought. Can you want to come play? And they're like, well, no one else will play with me, so yeah. So yeah. <laughs> eventually I got a grip of like four to five people. It was semi-inconsistent, but they were coming out and playing nonetheless, and I had a lot of fun, and I kind of just played through the main campaign of 4th edition you know, making some stuff up as I went and Mm -hmm. just buying a lot of the modules and reading a lot of the stuff and going from there. Um, I never read the Dungeon Master Guide. Um, That was my resolution for 2021, and I failed it, by the the way. I didn't even crack open the book. Um, Have you you even looked at the 5th edition one? No, I haven't. (laughs) I have not. So um, what, what you were telling all people looking to be a dungeon master is that you don't need the DM's guide. That's what you're saying. You really don't need the DM's guide because I, I would say the dungeon master guide is great for if you are trying to build a campaign in the in the Fey run, okay, or one of the associated official D D plane. Build a build a campaign as a sort of generic setting. Yes. Right. So but when it comes to running an adventure as a DM, where you're pretty much just like the manager of the story, okay? Mm-hmm. And you're trying to basically get that story told, okay, you don't need the Dungeon Manager's guide. You just need that adventure book. You know? You could pull Icewind Dale right off the shelf, flip it open to chapter one, and start right there. As long, need to know. As, as long as it has all of the magic items in that yeah. module, like tells what those magic items do. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the DM's guide is reference material for like, oh, I'm, I want to roll in the treasure chest table. <laughs> Where is that? I only have one tab of my DM's guide tab, and that's the loot table, because that's yeah. all I've ever used the DMG for is generating random loot. I mean, it does have a pretty, it has pretty extensive random encounter tables as well. Yeah. But like I said, it doesn't tell you, it doesn't teach you the fundamentals of running a game. It, you know? Yeah, it it has a, there's a lot of information in there. As you've never read it, you wouldn't know this. Uh, There, there's, there's a ton of information in there on, on creativity uh, and how, you know, kind of what you said, how to build campaigns. The specifics of running, I don't think it can write a book about that. Right. There's, just, there's just sort of general rules that other people tell you or that you learn through trial and error. In yeah. part three, there's chapter eight, which is called running the game, which is setting up table rules, mm-hmm. how to roll dice, what ability scores are how exploration works, social interaction, objects, combat, chases, CG equipment, a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Now, I think that's better explained in the player's guide, and I have read the player's guide. 
I would hope so, Lord. The player's handbook, though, to me, is a much better source to start with if I want someone to read, get into D&D specifically. Because that basically tells you how characters are created, what they are. Because all everything you have with creating a character applies to creating an NPC, essentially. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And no, how you interact with the world is the same with any monster or NPC you would make. The same rules apply to them as applies to the players. So you yep. don't need to you don't need to rehash that in the DM in the Dungeon Master's Guide on how to run an NPC. You're just creating a player and you're running with it. Yeah, so, the player the player's handbook is it's a, it's a must. Yeah. It, it is absolutely a requirement. Uh, the monster manual it, it's very useful, but you feasibly could run this game without ever looking at a monster manual. Yeah, because I mean, the, stat, you know, the stats are I mean they're just stats. It's still strength, dex, con, and so forth. When you get down to the breaking points of like, you know, when monsters level up and stuff like that and what proficiency a level five monster that CR, CR5 monster has compared to a CR4, yeah, that nitty gritty really only applies to creating the game. If you're running water deep, the monsters are already there. They're in the back of the book for you. So you don't yeah. need other ones. Granted, it will reference monsters from the monster manual and Volos and stuff like that, but it will tell you when that happens. So. You don't, you don't need to know those. They're just reference books. Mm -hmm. So, like for me, when it comes to how do you, how how do I get into dungeon mastering, it's for me it's buy the starter set, read through the starter set, and then find two friends and play the game. You know, that would just be you and two friends. It, for your first one, yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. probably smart. Uh, my my path was very very different from yours. My, mind you, I started I started D and D in 1990, so way the fuck back when I was like 15 year old kid, and I had I known about D and D, but I had never seen it played. I didn't have any friends who played it, no relatives who played it. I had a relative who played it, who I had met like once before, and never played D and D with them. So, for whatever reason, I'm at the mall. I see the red box. The real red box, not your fourth edition red box. <laughs> hey, F you, my red box is just as good as your red box. Uh, the the basic Dungeons and Dragons red box. And I picked it up, took it home, read it. And I spent a few months just sort of running myself through this. I created the characters. I ran them through the little modules that were in there as more of a practice, you know. My I will say I, I I did do that too. I did actually take a group of PCs that I made as practice characters and ran them through the adventure. Yeah, it's it's a useful thing to do because it's giving you an opportunity to play through the rules. And I did that for a few months on and off. And then I had one friend that I hung out with locally at the time, and I decided to run a game. So it was just me and him, and th we did that for probably a year on and off. Then I moved, and yeah, you know, after I moved, I met other friends, and then you know, just sort of devolved from there. And I started running for other people. I ran for my brother and some of his friends. Uh, then I started expanding out beyond just D and D at that point. Um, oh yeah, and along the way, probably the probably a year later, six months later, I bought the advanced D and D set, which is what you're much more familiar with. But yeah. yeah, I mean it. It's you know, it was just a thing of I bought it, and then I learned how to do it by practicing with it, and then I did it. Yeah. And I have no doubt that the shit that I ran in the beginning was terrible. <laughs> but when you're hanging out with your friends, especially friends who have never played D and D, who have never been around D and D, is any of it really terrible? Like right. you, it, you're just you're fine. just. Yeah, you're just being creative, and as long as you and them are having fun, that's all that really matters. Now, people yeah. people these days, they have access to things like Critical Role and Dungeon Run and all these other awesome you know, shows. So they can sit there and watch it long before ever diving into it. So at least they'll have an idea of what this game is like. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, too, like... I, I know I've mentioned this a few times where like I, I watched a lot of Chris Perkins mm -hmm. when I first started. 
And I feel a lot of how I run my games is how Chris Perkin kind of runs his, where he has a big, huge, epic set, does very little build up to that set, just like, all right, you guys are right here. What do you want to do? You know, kind of thing. Yes. Um, and kind of has this retroactive, this descriptive storytelling um, style to his versus like Matt Mercer, who has a very big build up you know, because he's a voice actor and an actor, you know, so he's got this much bigger build up and bigger kind of like surrounding world. And then he has players who are the exact same, do the exact same job that he does. So they build off of that and kind of have more social interaction kind of game. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm still very kind of like miniature tabletop, like, and that's how the story unfolds. Um, so maybe it's just, you know, find, find a DM that you like to watch and, and model, some of the stuff off of what he does, but learn, but understand that you have to learn what your style is. Yep. And then go from there. And, you know, if you can have experienced DMs play with you as players, they can give you some pointers, you know, but a good DM would know that just, you're just going to play how you're going to play, you know? Yeah. What one big difference between how, how you started and how I started though, is the, the modules and the campaigns. And I, I've, we've definitely talked about it before. But you started, and you you said it. You pretty much just when you ran for your friends, you just ran the modules that were in yeah. front of you. Whereas me, I I still to this day have never run a module other than Icewind Dale. Yeah. Like not, everything I've ever done has been me creating the system, uh, creating the world. Like I've only ever done homebrew. Right. And that's where the DM's guide actually steps in and helps out a lot is how to build that homebrew world. Like I said, yeah. I, I would definitely say run a module, run the starter set. Fandelver is one of the best written, well-balanced, challenging yet easy um, campaigns they've ever written. Now, I have run lots of campaign settings. I've run yeah. Forgotten Realms. I've run Dark Sun. I've run Dragonlance. But I've never run modules in them, you know, I, with Dragon Land specifically, because I have better memories of that one. You know, I set it during a specific time period of Dragon Lance because it, it sort of goes in different ages. And I ran a thing. It is basically think of it as going on during Star Wars Empire Return of the Jedi. And mine is just a little side mission that's going on that does not involve any of the main characters. So, you know, in Dragonlance, you had the uh, a lot of major characters during that time period. Sturm, Brightblade, uh, Raceland, you know, Caravan. All of these major characters that novels have been written about. All the shit I was running was taking place during that same time period, but I had no involvement with them. Anyway, uh, that's my thoughts on it. Right. You can kind of run whatever you want. Modules are definitely an easier way to get started and there's nothing wrong with running modules if you find that's not giving you what you want then go out learn to build your own campaign run yeah. it in even run it in forgotten realms if you like forgotten realms so much but there's a lot of information out there that is not touched in the current modules yeah and you know it's a big daunting task to like okay i'm gonna run something in fey run and like all the lore that's previously existed and all the lore that currently exists and all the stuff that's currently going on. And Blizzard, or Blizzard, <laughs> Watsy has come out and said that nothing in the past matters, nothing in, in the future matters. It's just your game and what you're playing now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of resources online where you can get information on stuff. But again, when it comes back to just starting to run the game, just find some friends, pick up a starter kit, run that campaign in the starter kit, have fun, make a lot of mistakes, and then just kind of like see how it all unfolds. And if you have players that are, you know, super critical and just mean to you because, oh, you're a new DM, you're not playing like Matt Mercer or anything like that, just find different players. And that's... yeah, That aspect of being a DM is probably pretty much the the hardest part, where finding good, consistent players who fit and like your style and will give you the benefit of that when you mess up and also kind of let, let you explore and kind of do some things. Cause if your players won't let you grow, you can't get better. 
and your players aren't going to grow and get better unless the year are also getting better. So you got to find a group that you all can kind of fail and keep playing it, it's each why and su- every single time. Yeah, yeah. It, it's why I suggest starting with friends. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't suggest hopping online and being like, "Hey guys, who I don't know in these random D and D groups." I, you know, I'm trying to find a group to run because then you're in. You're introducing yourself to people who you don't know their dynamic and they don't know you. So, you know, things that you say and or do might not fit what they want and vice yeah. versa. It's better to start this out with people that you are already comfortable with. Once you have a little experience, then sure, expand outward. Yeah. But it's much safer and much easier in the beginning with people you're good friends with. Because they'll yeah. let you, they'll let you do and say shit that yeah, other people might not. I guess the only other piece of advice I can give too is like you know play the game a, f- a few times first too. Um, you yeah. know what, know what strength is, what strength does, know what Dex does. You know, don't be calling for you know, know the difference the difference between when to call for a perception check and when to call for an investigation check. Like yeah. they're very two distinct things, and people get them confused a lot. So yeah, even even experienced DMs confuse the shit out of those, right? Um. So you know, and and, and on top of that, just like I said, even if you make the wrong call, a player that's a good player would just go, "All right," and just kind of go with it that way because that's what the DM said. And ultimately, you're you're the one running the table and running the game. Yeah. Um, so being a player first too will help you understand what it's like to kind of have that perspective for a little bit, and it will help you understand how combat works and all that. And once you know how combat works, and you know how the social interactions work, and you know how making skill checks work by being a player, that all just applies for being a DM. You're just doing it with seven goblins versus the the table. Yep. Yeah. Uh, one one thing that we haven't mentioned because uh, you said start with a module, and I absolutely agree with that. But you, you mentioned Fandelver as being an easy one. I personally, I would probably rather pull something off of DM's Guild that's for level one to like level one characters. That's just to, what Fandelver just, is. Well, uh, yeah. Okay, is, is that what Fandelver is? I thought Fandelver yeah. is a whole campaign. No, it's one through five. Okay, so it is a campaign. It's a short campaign, but... Yeah. Uh, I, for your first one, I would truthfully just for level, just a level one module. Uh, hell, well, you could uh, even uh, vo- not Volos, but uh, Yawning Portal. Yawning Portal has one that's no. just for. No. I, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> saying to use Yawning Portal. I'm pointing out that it has modules that are for just a level one group. Yeah, the um, first, the first, uh, the first ad- adventure, the first fight from level one to two in Found Elver mm-hmm. is you meet a guy at a bar. There's a social interaction. You have that kind of go off. He hires you to basically escort supplies to Fendelver because they're not making it there. There's a goblin ambush. By the way, this is the same setup for the fourth edition. <laughs> There's a goblin ambush along the road. Uh, you chase the goblins to the, to the Kragma cave. And in there, you fight a bunch of goblins, you fight a bunch of wolves, then you fight a bugbear, and then you make it to Fendelver. And... That's the entire like first level thing, and yeah. it's like I said, it's the same setup as the fourth edition one, except in the fourth edition one you saw a black knight on the road at the very end, um, and in this one you wind up in a town where there's bandits everywhere. Um, yeah, that, sounds, that sounds straightforward enough. Yeah, it's straightforward enough. It's very, it is the one meant to bring you into fifth edition, um, and I think they actually set it up. Specifically, too, because there's wolves in that Kragma den. And do you know what the wolf hit die is? I have no idea. Probably a D8 or a D10. It's a D8. And guess how many hit points your average first level player has? Uh, I would imagine eight. It is eight. So it is set up in a way that you may get your first TPK in your very first DM session because those two wolves will just eat them alive. It's very possible, but that's and when you think about it, that's just the life of an adventurer. Yeah, especially at first level, where everything, <laughs> where a fucking goblin can one hit you. 
<laughs> even a barbarian, um, even a barbarian is a two shot for a goblin at level one. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a goblin. Like when you when you sneak up on the if you if you sneak up on the cave, you meet some goblins outside around a campfire. One of them's wearing a pot on his head. <laughs> and then you just jump them and kill them. Uh, I have a lot of fun. Uh, Fan Delver is really great. I actually wanted to kind of like scale it up and run like a level five starting Fan Delver campaign, like Fan Delver on hard mode, mm-hmm. you know, and just see how how crazy that could get. That's been one of my ideas for a while. Wouldn't be that hard to do, I wouldn't imagine. Just restat some of the monsters. Well, add, maybe, maybe add a few monsters here and there. Yeah, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, fighting goblins is... It's hard to upstat them to five. Um, but I don't want to just upstat them. I want like to maybe even change from the encounter. So like when you encounter this big monster at CR six later on in the campaign. Okay. Well now he's a CR 20, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Maybe that like null that's in that one cave near the end is now, uh, something much bad, but bigger and badder, you know? So, but well, there you that, go. I yeah. guess, I guess start, that's some general start advice. And yep. Start with Van Delver. If you need me to, I'll buy you a kit. They're like 10 bucks. So, cheap hand them out here's here's your first set i'll play the first game with you and i will die because i'll be a wizard and i'll run and the wolf will bite me and i'll just die yeah you'll die because you don't know spells we've already <laughs> determined that <laughs> you'd yeah, i forgot that you, you could you shield pulled... magic missiles yeah <laughs> yeah oh uh, look it's like is it mage armor no is it is it uh is it Mage Hand? No. I was like, damn, what's that spell? I can't remember. Magic yeah. Missile. No. Yeah, nobody uses Shield to stop Magic Missiles. Everybody uses Shield for plus five armor class. I, I knew that it did, but I forgot the spell, and I couldn't find it on the quick list there. It was just like, well, I'll just eat them. Yeah, How because, back you, this because you, were, you were probably just thinking, oh, Shield just gives plus five AC. No, I, I knew that Shield did. I just couldn't remember it was the Shield spell. Like, Okay. Like, it's like you ever like get up to go to the bathroom or like how do I go to the bathroom? Like you just forget? No. And then like you walk into the kitchen instead and you're like, oh shit, I have to go to the bathroom and then you run out to the bathroom. Oh, I forget what I'm in the process of doing every single yeah. day all the time. I've never forgotten when I'm going to the bathroom. Yeah. So like, well, maybe you're not old enough yet. <laughs> another another thirty years maybe. Uh, all right. Yeah, well, when I, another thirty years, I'm not going to get up to go to the bathroom. I'm just going to stay sitting where I'm at. <laughs> That's what depends are for. Anyways, um, if you're listening to this, the following com- upcoming weekend, we're going to be at Scarab, at uh, in Columbia, South Carolina. If you're in the area or around the area, come by and visit. Um, it's like twenty bucks to come in to the con floor, wear a mask, I guess, and just, you know, be careful. Um, but we'll be doing a live stream that Saturday, Saturday night. Instead oh, of like a normal stream. Yeah. I'll be running, uh, my dread of the ice devil. You're in the game. You've made a PC for it. Yeah. Gorgi rotten hand. And, uh, I'll be streaming that. Hopefully it'll all work out and doesn't mess up, but you can come watch us perform this live for everybody and it should hopefully be a lot of fun and we'll give you a bookmark if you show up maybe some dice i don't know right when i screw up on the rules while playing i don't care i don't want to hear from anyone except the dm you can tell jay that he's wrong and how bad his advice is and you can tell me how great i am and uh, i'll give you a free copy of dread the ice if you tell me i'm great yeah all right that's it goodbye greg bye greg bye greg is it craig or greg i keep forgetting i I don't know have we have we hired a new intern yet well apparently our intern giark left are we sure he's not just on a quest did we like have him get coffee or something i don't drink coffee I am south, bounding down. All my rolls are crits. It's time for me to hit the bricks. 